How is everyone doing? Strength Trap episode 79 and today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I'm joined by the owner and director of JPS Health and Fitness. He's also a competitive powerlifter and bodybuilder. He's coached numerous, numerous clients to success. Today I am joined by Jacob Skepis. How are you doing? I'm very good, man. It's an honor to be on the show and uh, have a platform to talk to all of your listeners. So thank you for having me. No worries at all. I think uh, everyone listening, uh, you being uh, over in Australia, will be a little bit jealous of the of the weather. Uh, we're having a typical uh, British summer, um, a little being a little bit miserable. Although having said that, I did get burnt uh, on Saturday and it wasn't even that warm. So I have no idea how that <laughs> happened. Um, how are you doing? What have you been up to? What's been, what's been happening in your world? Yeah, man. So I've been uh, very well, very busy. Down here, it's very cold. So that's uh, never welcomed. And I often deal with a lot of our clients and members uh, who are quite demotivated uh, and a little bit unforgiving towards the harsh uh, conditions that are down here in Melbourne because we do see uh, four seasons in one day and when it's cold, it's very cold. Uh, so yeah, very good. What's been happening? A lot of things. Uh, I'm actually coming over to the UK uh, next month to Bath. So I'll be presenting uh, a seminar there with Revive Stronger on all things contest prep. So hopefully any of the listeners who are in the area uh, and are free on the 14th of July. It'd be awesome to see them there. We've also been working on an ebook for contest prep, which will be released at that seminar. So everyone will get a free copy who attends. Uh, but apart from that, we've got the ultimate evidence-based conference uh, happening this weekend here in Melbourne that we are hosting. Uh, so we've got uh, a lot of really big names, very intelligent people coming down for the weekend to present uh, different lectures over the course of three days. So that's very exciting. Uh, apart from that, uh, all the usual work. So it's exam time for our mentorship students. So uh, getting through a bunch of exams. And this is where I do feel for teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Having to correct this uh, is quite an arduous task. Um, and amongst all that, just the usual stuff. Coaching, working with my athletes. Got a lot of uh, guys and girls competing in uh, season B in Australia here for... Uh, physique sports and I am competing this weekend funnily enough amongst the conference in powerlifting Australia open nationals uh, okay. with two of my athletes so uh, it's going to be a very busy weekend uh, busy month ahead we're going to Singapore before the UK and then hopefully the back end of the year is going to be a little bit more tame uh, less interruptions with travel and all those sorts of things because the first half of the year was quite hectic but yeah. Uh, yeah, apart from that, things are really well. Uh, stress is good uh, when it's managed and when it's deliberate and uh, when it's within the tolerance and threshold of what somebody is capable of, uh, you know, working with. So uh, all is good. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, I saw the the conference that is that is happening in Melbourne, and um, yeah, there is quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of big names um, going down, which um, would be. Yeah, exciting to see having having those having those people having those people speak, um, which you, you know which will be cool. Uh, how are you feeling for the uh, for the competition over the weekend? Man, the body is primed. I have uh, gone through what is uh, feels like a really successful uh, preparation for nationals, uh, but it wasn't really successful until the final. Uh, four weeks when I decided that I should put my athlete hat on uh, and wear that a little bit more often. So the first half of the prep was uh, very challenging. I was managing quite uh, a lot of uh, yeah different bits and pieces with work. My workload was actually very, very heavy. Um, a lot of travel. Uh, I've got two young kids. So one of them was actually very, very sick. Uh, so it was really challenging initially, uh, but fortunately things have settled down. I've also I've been very diligent in trying to manage myself uh, as best I can, which yeah. plays a huge role in how we respond to training stress. Uh, so the last half of the prep has been phenomenal, uh, pretty flawless for the most part, and I'm feeling really good. So hopefully going to get up there and shift some tin and <laughs> put up a good performance. Oh, cool. Well, uh, all the best. All the best for the weekend. Um, thank you. 
So uh, I, I mentioned in the in the email that um, following the the content that yourself and uh, JPS Health and Fitness put out there, um, the content is really really uh, helpful uh, and in, and informative. Um, for some people who uh, may not know how you got into the position that you're in now, or may not have may not have even followed the the work that, that you and JPS JPS Health and Fitness do. Um, do you just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself? Yeah, man. So uh, I firstly really appreciate uh, you following along the content. I put in a lot of work uh, to <laughs> deliver that stuff uh, for free, obviously. And it's great to see that it's being well received and hopefully helping people. Uh, so I got into fitness like most people, very insecure, uh, dissatisfied, angry, young teenager at the age of 15. I uh, stumbled into the gym because I wanted to change the way I looked uh, and that involved training to failure, hitting the chest from all angles, uh, you know, six different variations for the pecs in one session, <laughs> about 50 grams of carbs per day plus two to three cardio sessions a day, all that kind of jazz. I got very, very lean, so uh, that worked, uh, but it wasn't very sustainable um, and I started to experience a lot of hardship and just lack of progress. So uh, with that, I started to research, I started to learn and read, and I very much value uh, education uh, as I was taught by my father, um, who's a very well-educated man, uh, that yeah, knowledge is power and application of knowledge is extremely powerful. Uh, so I really endeavored uh, to be able to troubleshoot the problems that I was facing, and I thought that the best way to do that was to get more learned and uh, hit the books. And I was fortunate over time to stumble across some brilliant minds uh, who got me into the evidence-based practice side of things. Uh, along this journey, I, I was personal training straight out of high school. I then opened a facility when I was 21 called JPS, funnily enough. And from there, I have now grown the company uh, to a point where we do far more than just personal training. And it's about a lot more than uh, just me. So that's very, very cool. We have a facility in Airport West. We've got 12 coaches. Uh, we do about 400 to 500 sessions, one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions per week. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of members. We do a lot of online coaching now and we are transitioning into the education arena uh, to hopefully share with other coaches and people interested in developing their physique uh, and their strength and just improving their approach to fitness uh, so that we can share our insights, our experiences and knowledge um, to better the industry. So that's a little bit about uh, yeah, JPS and the evolution and genesis of the company. And amidst all that, I was uh, engaging in some competitive bodybuilding. I was quite successful there. Uh, multiple seasons, I won a few state championships, all that kind of thing. So that was fun. Um, not really fun at the time, but fun in hindsight. Um, <laughs> And then uh, after that, I transitioned into some powerlifting. Um, funnily enough, building muscle is kind of uh, a big deal if you want to be strong. Uh, and I was quite strong, uh, competed at a national level, came second in nationals in 2016, uh, and am now going back for more uh, this weekend. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, very much been a journey of trial, error, learn, refine, uh, and just strive for progress and uh, improvement. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with what you had, what you said there. You know, just um, everyone can always learn more. There's always more stuff that you can you can find out. And the keyword there is progress. Everything can can keep getting better. And um, what I really like about the um, just on a on a, a selfish note, myself as a as a coach and lifter myself, the the content that you put out there, um, I started off just sort of yeah, I'll do this because this this looks good. Or so I watched that and that looks good, but. The more you go into it, and since um, since going to university, leaving leaving university, and seeing the uh, the content that yourself as a coach puts out, um, it does go to show that you know there are, there is always something to to learn learn and put out there. Totally. Um, was there was it always a natural progression to go into uh, the education side of things, or uh, was that always a goal that you had in mind? Uh, I guess as a very lofty goal, I'm kind of a a dreamer. Um, I like to call it optimistic. Uh, my business partner and brother calls me delusional, uh, but that's where we really balance each other out, fortunately, because he's uh, quite a realist. He's very much 
grounded. And as my dad says, he is the reins and I am like a bull in a China shop. So I'll have an idea <laughs> and it's full steam ahead. And uh, it's Samuel, uh, my brother, his job uh, to make sure that I don't destroy all of the China uh, <laughs> and uh, steer things in a positive, productive and fruitful direction. So uh, from the onset, the idea was to be big and grand. Uh, like most fitness professionals, I don't think anybody really sets out to you know, uh, be just a small time PT in a big box gym for the rest of their life. Um, and that was certainly the case for me. I wanted more. I wanted to have a facility. I wanted to have multiple coaches, uh, you know, working alongside me. I wanted to be educating them and, uh, you know, have my facility be, uh, I guess the, you know, the primary place that people come to learn about training and nutrition. Uh, and as with uh, the development of technology and the advancements that we now have, uh, we know that there is, uh, you know, only so much that we can do in one very limited uh, geographical location uh, and expanding to uh, the internet, which is a very beautiful thing, uh, is one way that we can not only diversify uh, the business, which is a very good idea if uh, financial, you know, gains are what you're interested in. I think any business that says otherwise would be silly. Um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, the plan was always to educate, uh, whether it was my clients, uh, our members. Um, and it just so happens that this uh, little thing called social media and the internet happens. And we've been able to take what we do and put it on a different platform that's available worldwide uh, at the touch of a button. And that's really, really grown. And it's been very cool to experiment with. And uh, yeah, we're seeing some success now with what we do and that's also very cool and I'm very grateful that we have, you know, people like yourself and uh, other folk around the world who are willing to listen and, uh, you know, value the information that we put out. So, yeah, it was always a goal, uh, but I'd never expected it to be where it is today. I actually wrote uh, down my dream job uh, six years ago, um, you know, a full page description of what every minute of that day would look like and what my roles and responsibilities would be. Um, and man, what I'm doing now, uh, absolutely blows that out of the park. Um, <laughs> so it, it's really cool. And I guess to the listeners, it just goes to show that, you know, you don't need to be special. You don't need to be the most educated, the most talented, um, or even the most hardworking, but you just need to have direction, find what you're good at, know what you suck at, surround yourself with people who are better than you at what you suck at uh, to pick up the slack. Um, and act with integrity and if you work hard and do the right things more often than not, uh, over time, you know, you can progress things, uh, beyond what you thought you were capable of. And that's definitely been the case for me. So, yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, you know, with the, uh, everything that you're, that you're putting out there, you know, it is, um, it is quality work and, you know, it's reaching, reaching a wider audience. Um, and, and, you know, I know for, for myself that, um, originally, you know, I started the podcast just as uh, trying to answer questions from for my for my clients yeah. and members, um, and then it got to a point where I didn't feel confident enough giving them a, a direct answer. So I sort of wanted to reach out and speak to coaches who I look up to and, and respect, and you know, I wanted to um, show the the clients and members that I work with that the the knowledge and content that that you have. Um, Going on to the uh, the uh, meat of the podcast, if you like, obviously you've mentioned yeah. about a more of an evidence based approach and um, having a little bit more knowledge when you go into your training rather than just winging it a little bit. And there was um, a couple of clients have uh, have asked me, and it just so happened that you actually put a um, a, a bit of uh, content out there about muscle damage versus muscle mm -hmm. growth. And I think sometimes, especially when people come into the gym and they're, yeah, I want to, I want to put muscle on. And you mentioned it there that, oh yeah, you do so many variations of chest exercises and train to failure. Uh, just want to expand and explain on muscle damage versus yeah. muscle growth um, for people that maybe get their wires crossed a little bit when it comes, when it comes to that topic. Awesome. Awesome. So let's, uh, yeah, firstly start. Uh, with some really, really basic concepts uh, related to physiology and the way that we apply training stress. So every set that we perform in the gym, every repetition uh, is a stress to the body and that is providing 
uh, resistance on the muscles uh, to overcome the gravitational pull uh, of the weight that we are lifting. And that can be in the form of barbells, dumbbells, cables, all of those sorts of things. The, it is added weight uh, to the musculature and the tissues contract uh, in order to overcome that resistance and move the weight. So at a very uh, simple level, uh, resistance training is simply putting tension on the muscle and that tension is a stress. Now, when we stress a muscle, uh, it then goes through a cascade of uh, you know, mechanical changes and then biochemical changes um, that affect uh, our physiology and hopefully see positive adaptation because that is essentially what we desire when we go to the gym. We want positive adaptation and those adaptations be morphological in nature, uh, you know, such as the muscle growing. Now, when we stress a muscle, uh, there is tension that is placed on that muscle and that is the primary uh, factor that will influence uh, metabol uh, sorry, not metabolic, muscle protein synthesis. Now, muscle protein synthesis is basically the upregulation of a constructing protein within the muscle. Now, when we damage muscle, uh, we, we see an increase in muscle protein breakdown. Now, every time we train, the muscle gets broken down to a certain degree, and we, we'll talk about uh, how that happens more shortly. But what happens following that breakdown is the recovery process where we start to repair the tissue and then because of the stress and the way that the body works, it's a very dynamic and adaptive organism. It will repair itself beyond previous levels, so your previous baseline, uh, to ensure that you can tolerate that same stress or a very similar stress in the future, and that is adaptation. Now, when we have too much muscle damage, uh, which is a type of fatigue that is localized to the muscle, so it's peripheral, meaning that it's within the muscle itself, it's not central, uh, we see... Uh, a greater time below the curve uh, where we're not building tissue. So there is an amount of muscle damage uh, that is necessary in a byproduct of putting tension on the muscles, but too much and we will see less muscle protein synthesis. And over the course of days, weeks and months, we want to see our net protein synthesis exceed our muscle protein breakdown. And that is what's going to cause muscle growth. So muscle damage uh, is the micro level damage to the contractile elements of the tissue. And that occurs in both concentric and eccentric training, but mostly in eccentric training. Uh, and it's generally associated with a feeling of DOMS after training. So the, the issue that a lot of people have is that if they don't feel sore, they feel like they haven't worked out. But we know that there are adaptive mechanisms that the body uh, goes through in order to ensure that the stimulus that we expose it to is less damaging over time. And that is both a positive thing and it's a negative thing uh, because if we don't change the stimulus, well, it becomes less and less potent over time, meaning that we get less and less adaptation. And if we don't increase the stimulus at all, then what ends up happening is that that stimulus is below uh, the required threshold level for us to get a net change in muscle protein synthesis. But again, too much muscle damage and that will impede uh, upon our ability to synthesize new tissue. So what people experience, like I mentioned, is that feeling of soreness and they will generally change their training in order to make it very, very damaging and experience a lot of soreness. But that is not necessarily a good thing because as I mentioned, it will impair protein synthesis. And when we train and train and train more and more, uh, we induce the repeat about it effect, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're not getting a stimulus for growth. It just means that we are tolerating that same stress better and better. So long story short, it, it is perceived that uh, muscle damage may play a uh, correlative role in muscle growth, but not a causative role. Uh, it's a byproduct of stressing the body, uh, but the primary stress that we need for muscle growth is mechanical tension. And if we're setting up our training structure uh, within the microcycle and the mesocycles correctly, and we are increasing the stimulus uh, that, so that it's within uh, our adaptive tolerance, but above our threshold uh, to see that stimulus uh, be positive in terms of the adaptations that we accrue from that, uh, we don't necessarily need to be extremely sore or experience high degrees of muscle damage. And a very simple way to think of this is for every unit of muscle damage that we get, uh, that is potentially uh, less 
muscle protein synthesis. So more damage may mean less hypertrophy. Um, and over time we want growth and that's going to come from increasing, uh, the mechanical tension that's placed on the fibers, um, and the force impulse that they're experiencing, uh, within a set, uh, within a week, so on and so forth. Yeah. So just sort of two, uh, follow up questions from everything that you, that you've mentioned there. Um, do you think the common mistakes that people will do is just go into the gym and try and do everything like what you, like what you mentioned at the start, doing loads and lo loads of variations um, because they don't understand the, uh, the, the physiology bit behind it? And as well, what, what are your thoughts on, you can see in some, in some uh, sort of, uh, there are areas where people will um, train to failure or change the... Mm -hmm. um, change the range of movement of the, of the lift and the, um, can work out for hours and hours, really, really long workouts. Um, are there some of the common mistakes that sort of people think, oh, well, I need to train longer or I need to train to failure or do more and more? Yeah, totally. So we need to understand that uh, there is a maximum amount of training stimulus uh, that we can recover from. And there is... Uh, also a maximum amount of training stimulus uh, that will be beneficial uh, within a session. So when we look to the recommended uh, starting points for training volume recommendations, we see that there's anywhere from 10 to 20 sets per week being the ballpark figure that uh, most people will see some pretty good results with uh, per muscle group per week. That is now, when we look to the intensity component, so training to failure, uh, there are two ways that we can define this. Number one is the intensity of load, which is generally the percentage of 1RM, but more specific and correlated with muscle growth uh, is relative intensity. So our proximity to failure, so our reps in reserve, our rate of perceived effort using those scales to measure how hard and how fatiguing training is. Now, provided we meet a minimum intensity threshold of an RPE of six or RIR of four or more, and we are training with an appropriate amount of training volume, meaning that we are exposing the muscles to a sufficient amount of stress, uh, we will see adaptation. Now, this applies not only within the week, so 10 to 20 sets being the recommended range uh, per, per muscle group per week, but it also applies to a workout. And we're starting to see uh, through some research that there might be a cap uh, or a ceiling within a session for a, for a particular muscle group on how much training stress is indeed beneficial before we see regression and plateau. And that range is generally between 10 to 15 uh, sets per muscle group. So any more than that, and we might be uh, just flogging a dead horse for the lack of a better word. So what a lot of people will do is they're quite insecure. Uh, they don't understand uh, training, phys the physiology behind training and uh, these uh, research papers that are elucidating that there is a certain amount of training that we can do within a session and within a week that is going to be productive. And they will just throw shit at a wall and hope that something sticks. And Generally, this comes in the form of doing four to five, even more exercises within a single session, three to five sets of each exercise. And again, beyond a certain point, they are flogging a dead horse. And yeah. that extra stimulus is just extra fatigue and muscle damage uh, that they're not going to recover from and is going to lead to less adaptation. So what I recommend uh, to any of the people listening who want to figure out what an appropriate dose of training stress is within a session and within a week is to start anywhere from eight to 15 sets per muscle group per week and see if you are performing better, see if you're recovering well, and then slowly titrate more and more volume in over time when you see uh, stalls and you're still recovering. So again, back to the uh, original point, doing too much within a session is simply unproductive and there's an optimal range and a sweet spot that we need to find. Uh, so the process of doing that is to start with a moderate amount of training volume uh, that you know that you can recover from, uh, that is not going to be too taxing and then slowly increasing the stress over time, whether it's the RPE or potentially increasing uh, the number of working sets that you perform per muscle group 
per session per week. And then uh, you'll be able to determine, okay, this was too much. And this is where I started to see my recovery really be impaired from session to session, week to week, and my performance started to drop off. When you start to notice those kind of uh, metrics uh, regressing, that's when you know that you've hit that ceiling and you're no longer recovering. Because a really important point is that we don't get adaptation unless we recover. recover. And yeah. recovery by definition is returning to baseline. So if we're doing so much work in a single session and by the next time we train that muscle group or the next time we do that session, we haven't yet recovered to baseline, uh, that's when you'll start to see decrements in your performance. So again, understanding uh, the stimulus recovery and the adaptation model uh, and providing the appropriate amount of stimulus, ensuring that you recover and then making sure that the subsequent stimulus and stress is within uh, your adaptive potential uh, is very, very necessary. And a big mistake that a lot of people make is that they think they need to force muscle growth by adding weight to the bar. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's not necessarily the right way to look at it because our ability to add weight of, to the bar or do more reps or do more, more sets is a sign that we have done things right in prior training sessions because we are now seeing an increase in our fitness uh, and greater adaptation, which is allowing us to overload our training. We don't overload our training to get adaptation, uh, that overload comes by necessity of prior adaptations because if we then don't overload our training, we are going to fall below that threshold level of stimulus that we need to get future growth and adaptations. Did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. The, it's a, it was a really good explanation because I think sometimes people will, will come in and it's always, I, I need to do everything. I need to dive straight in uh, and, I need, and I need to do... Um, as as much as I can, whereas sometimes it is yeah. like you said, you know, start off gradually, uh, gradually, and, and and build it up. Um, and as well, you know, recovery is a is a is a really really big thing. And I I found that sometimes the the training side of things that you know when um, clients and members are in the gym, you can manage that and control that a lot more. But obviously, sometimes. You don't when people go home and you know they're not in the in the gym and the the coach isn't there. That that's where you know the the recovery side of things need to need to have everyone. Um, there's been totally. a couple of, couple of clients that I've had that oh well I'll I'll come in and do I'll do one session and then I'll uh, try and fit another session in on the evening after work and then I'll come straight in tomorrow and it's you know exactly as you say you know you need you need to get that recovery in. And I think sometimes that's. Uh, an overlooked, an, an overlooked element on that. Um, in terms totally. of the actual, I think, uh, just on that point, yeah, sorry, just on that point, I think uh, what people often forget is that when we plan training, that is simply periodization, and one of the fundamental critiques of periodization is that it's an overly rigid model because it doesn't account for the highly dynamic and ever changing neurobiological uh, framework that our body is providing within a session uh, and our ability to tolerate recover from and adapt to stress uh, is impacted by a myriad of variables such as our sleep and nutrition whether we're in hypo or hypercaloric conditions so at a deficit or a surplus uh, whether we are you know not stressing uh, about work we're not experiencing any emotional or psychological tension and stress uh, we are you know, and healthy physiological states. So we're not sick. We're not recovering from illnesses because training stress doesn't just affect the musculoskeletal system. There, there's a lot of other biological systems that we, uh, you know, impact and disrupt when we impose such a high degree of, you know, high intensity, very high stress uh, stimulus. So we really need to understand that uh, there is only so much we can recover from. Uh, our lifestyle factors and all of uh, the stresses within our life will play a really big role in our ability to tolerate that stress, recover, and then adapt. Uh, so we need to recognize uh, how much of an influence uh, our non-training related stresses are going to have on the way that we design a program. So I think they're all very worthy considerations. And in many cases, our volumes and our intensities need to be adapted from session to session, week to week, month to month, uh, due to the forever changing circumstances um, and the bio neurobiological backdrop uh, that we are dropping that training stress onto. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Just on a, 
on a slight sort of tangent there with the obviously you mentioned about uh, stress and sleep, sort of the external factors um, that are outside of the gym. How much of a because I've had clients before that have had poor sleep, the sleep. Uh, we've corrected their sleep, and then all of a sudden, um, their 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 training, you know, imp- improves massively. How much of a detrimental effect can really high stress levels um, and lack of sleep have on training and you know muscle growth? And what are sort of the how would you tailor the program depending on high stress levels and lack of sleep? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So. Firstly, uh, when we look at stress, the body doesn't differentiate uh, between stresses. So in essence, the body is pulling from the same pool of adaptive resources uh, to recover from and tolerate any stress, whether it's psychological, uh, whether it's uh, you know, lack of sleep or whether it's a training stress. Uh, so stress can be classified in many, many ways. Um, and there's different terms to, uh, describe the different types of, we have acute stresses, which are a short term challenge, uh, such as a training, right? We have brief naturalistic stresses, which involve like events that are normal, but still very challenging. We have, uh, and then continue to yield stress in the future, chronic stress, which is, uh, Exposure to long-term stress, which is what you know, uh, poor sleep hygiene may lead to uh, if it's not managed. And then we have distant stresses, which are things that we stress about um, that are not immediate, but they're things that we uh, foresee to be stressful uh, coming ahead. Right. Uh, so if we're not sleeping, uh, we are essentially impairing our body's ability to go through all of the regenerative processes that it needs to in to- in order to restore our physiology right so uh if we're not sh- sleeping properly we're not going to be recovering and therefore we're not going to be able to adapt to the same level because the body's got to repair mul- and regenerate multiple different systems not just musculoskeletal system so whilst uh, one or two nights of poor sleep may not necessarily impact somebody's uh, training program, their ability to tolerate certain workloads, uh, if that uh, same poor sleep, uh, you know, both in quantity and, and quality, uh, extends for long periods of time, it will change from uh, a very acute time-limited stress to something that is more chronic. And when it's chronic stress, uh, that's when we really start to see maladaptation and the body essentially uh, will not be able to have the resources, genetically costly process. Uh, and it's not from a biological standpoint uh, ideal or in, in fact necessary uh, for the body to build more muscle tissue. That's a luxury. Uh, so you really need to have all your ducks lined up uh, yeah. in a row before your body starts synthesizing uh, skeletal muscle. So yeah. Training stress uh, is very much going to be limited by sleep uh, and how much uh, somebody is recovering from all the stress that they're experiencing in their life. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, if I have an, a client uh, who may be experiencing uh, multiple days or potentially weeks where their sleep is uh, just not where it should be or where, where we need it to be for them to uh, tolerate uh, the current program and the workloads within that uh, will generally decrease their volume by a third, sometimes even a half. And the strategies come into play, and we've got many different fatigue management strategies. We can auto-regulate our fatigue management. Uh, so you know, within the plan, we have you know things like RPE. Uh, we can auto-regulate number of train, um, or we can plan these in, in a more formal and proactive manner, such as taking rest days. Uh, you might even it's being an extremely potent means of uh, reducing training stress uh, and fatigue. So we can plan in those uh, proactive strategies, so rest days, light days, and deloads. I think that's always a good idea. But then having some form of auto-regulation where you can uh, up-regulate and down-regulate training workload uh, based on the individual's readiness to train and how well recovered they are. And obviously sleep plays a big role in recovery. So when sleep uh, is in the toilet for long periods of time, uh, you know, we're not waiting for a deload in four weeks. 
we can just simply uh, adjust the plan so that we can get some training stress and it's within uh, their adaptive uh, tolerance uh, and it's going to be beneficial and productive and not detrimental uh, and impairing their uh, their recovery and obviously their progress. Yeah, I think sometimes working with clients, they sometimes think the program is is going to be set in stone and right. This is this this is the only thing that that I need to do. Um, but we have had people come. If only it was that simple. Yeah, yeah. If it were, if it was that easy, but you know, dealing with as a as a coach, you're dealing with uh, the the person, and when they're coming in, you know, I always like to try and make a point of. How's your bit? How's your day been today? What, what's been going on? I've had a really, I've had a really crappy day. Um, I've argued with my missus, or I've argued with my boss, or anything. So stress is really high, or I've been traveling around with work. Right today, like you know, a good example that you said there, dropping down um, their their workout by by a third, and being like, right, this is what we're, this is what we're going to do today. And then um, what I, what I quite like is that it is it's educating the 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 client. It's not so much of right, you're going to do this. It's like, you know, there's a reason why we're asking you to do this. We're not trying to, you know, rob you of your gains or anything like that. It's, you know, we're doing this for a reason so that, you know, it's only going to help them uh, in, in the long run rather than, especially, you know, you mentioned there about the, um, the body doesn't differ between, between stresses, just adding, in, adding on more stress that ultimately isn't going to help them, you know, achieve, achieve their goals. Exactly. Um, so going on to the, uh, the, uh, the programming side of things, uh, programming side of things, then obviously we've touched on that people can throw, throw everything at it and have loads and loads of variations of, of, of exercises. And, um, the one thing that I like to keep in mind is, you know, keep it, keep it simple. Um, so in terms of the exercise selection, what would be the boxes that you want to, you need to tick um, when it comes to, um, you know, working for uh, muscle growth? Yeah, so in terms of program design uh, for muscle growth, uh, the first thing we want to be trying to achieve is a sufficient mechanical stress mechanical load loading and tension which is what i started to discuss about earlier and at a physiological level this means uh a decent weight uh to recruit high threshold motor units uh which will then uh cause all those hypertrophic adaptations that we want um or a sufficient effort and relative intensity again because as we fatigue through a set we know that Henneman's size principle uh, once those uh, slow twitch fibers are fatigued we then see the fast twitch fibers recruited upon uh, in order to meet the force demands of uh, the set that we're performing uh, and that will give us the mechanical tension that will lead to the cascade of uh, anabolic processes that lead to muscle growth and altering protein synthesis but we don't just need mechanical tension. We also need a sufficient duration of tension. And this can be thought of as just exposure to tension. So that's essentially our volume. So we need intensity and volume. And then frequency is not necessarily uh, a training variable uh, that has a direct uh, effect on muscle growth, but it's the way in which we organize uh, our mechanical tension and the exposure we get to that mechanical tension. So they're the three big variables that we're going to be looking at when I'm trying to design a hypertrophy program. And we know through the literature that there's a dose response relationship with volume and hypertrophy, meaning that with more volume, so more exposure to that tension stimulus, we get more growth up until a point. So it's almost like an inverted U. Uh, we don't necessarily see linear gains with more and more volume, uh, but we'll see volume peak and then slowly start to, to drop off uh, once we exceed our recovery abilities. Now, as I mentioned, we need that intensity threshold to be satisfied. So we either need to lift heavy, lift hard, or a combination of both. Yeah. So for a set volume, we're going to be looking for anywhere between 10 to 20 cents per muscle group per week with a relative intensities of an RP of six or more. Now, in terms of distributing that volume throughout the week, we generally want to see uh, volume be distributed so that we're not exceeding our per session volume uh, thresholds 
uh, as I mentioned, it's around 10 to 15 sets per workout. So if we're doing 10 to 20 sets uh, per workout, we probably want to be training a muscle group two to three times a week so that we can evenly distribute that volume across those sessions. Now, they're the three big variables that we need to tick. Once we have those set in place, the next step is to look to our exercise selection. And we need to remember that muscle growth is a tension dependent process. As I discussed previously, it is not an exercise dependent process, meaning that there is no specific exercises we need to perform to build muscle. That's not to say that some are you know, all exercises are created equal in uh, stressing muscle tissue because that's certainly not, not the case because if it was, uh, if I just brush my teeth every minute of every day, <laughs> I would get huge. Um, or if I did bozo ball squats, uh, I would also, you know, have very big legs and be, you know, winning bodybuilding shows because my legs were just so big. That's simply not the case because uh, some exercises are just better at eliciting attention stimulus than others because they allow us to be more stable. They allow us to use greater absolute loads uh, and they stress the muscles in a way uh, that causes them to contract uh, in, in, with high force outputs, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, exercises are generally going to fall into a number of categories that will train the primary movement patterns uh, of the human body. So we have the squat pattern, we have a hinge pattern, we have a vertical pull and a push, and we have a horizontal pull and push. And then we have our isolation exercises that can help us fill in the gaps. So again, there is no specific exercises uh, that we need to use to build muscle, uh, but some are going to be very, very uh, stimulative of growth uh, and others not so much. So generally, we want to bias most of our training around uh, multi-joint exercises and use those single joint exercises such as our lateral raises, our bicep curls to fill in the gaps for when the compound lifts may not be getting enough tension on a smaller muscle group, for example. And another really important concept uh, that Dr. Mike Israel has come up with is the stimulus to fatigue ratio, uh, which basically uh, highlights how some exercises are highly stimulative, uh, but also carry with them a fatigue component. And this is going to be very, very individual dependent uh, and exercise dependent also. For example, somebody with uh, really long femurs and a very short torso is going to find the uh, low bar squat extremely fatiguing. Uh, and if they're using that for a quad exercise, uh, they're not going to get a lot of stimulus on the quads, but they're going to get a lot of fatigue. So that might be a movement that somebody with those kind of uh, leverages would not want to prioritize in their program simply because the amount of fatigue outweighs the amount of stimulus. Uh, mm -hmm. Conversely, if you had someone with very short femurs and a very long torso, it's going to be a lot easier for them to get into a deep squat position and they're going to get far more stimulus on the quads with very minimal uh, you know, fatigue of other muscles. So the high bar squat, for example, might be a very, very stimulative movement and not very fatiguing and that would be an exercise to include in their program. And this applies across the board. Uh, but basically, you need to focus on getting the dose of training stress in you know, a very appropriate range. Uh, there's no hard and fast number, anyone and everyone. It's going to be a range, and that range will change over time depending on nutrition, sleep, recovery, lifestyle, all those sorts of things. Uh, we need to train with an appropriate frequency so that we can distribute that volume across the week that allows us to get sufficient stimulus within the session, but not so much that we're not recovering uh, from one session to another. And then we also need to meet that intensity threshold. So we need to lift heavy, we need to lift hard, and progressively uh, do more and more over time as a result of the adaptations we get from training. And um, we can use exercises that we enjoy, that feel good, and if we're getting pumps and we can eat in uh, muscle groups that we're not trying to target in a certain exercise, that's a good thing. And if we train the primary movement patterns of the human body uh, with those isolation exercises to fill in the gaps, uh, we're in a really good spot. Uh, and there will be the four primary variables we look at when we set up a program. And then we just need to adhere to the training principles. So the principles are essentially going to determine how we uh, select the variables and how we manipulate them. But basically we need the specific adaptations to the imposed uh, demands we want. So that's the said principle. Uh, so we get what we train for. So we want that muscle growth, meaning that we need that uh, mechanical tension and exposure to tension, right? Yeah. Uh, we also need to ensure that there is some form of progressive overload that is planned into our training program. And I can talk a little bit more, more about that shortly. Uh, we also need to manage fatigue. So having light days, rest days, 
deloads or to regulating our training. Uh, we also need to make sure that the program is individualized, so it caters to the person's uh, unique uh, neurobiological state, as well as their preferences, their lifestyle, and what they can adhere to and stick to for a long period of time. Because at the end of the day, uh, if you design a program that's going to build a lot of muscle in six weeks, I would call you an idiot because you don't build a lot of muscle in six weeks unless you're taking some Mexican supplements. So you need to think about how you can design a program that's going to build a lot of muscle in six years. And that's generally going to mean, you know, keeping things enjoyable, uh, making sure that you're seeing progress uh, in the metrics that you want to be seeing progress in, because that's super motivating and very rewarding. You need to manage injury, monotony and strain, uh, and just keep people in the game. So once you do those things and you have some form of periodization in there, meaning that you just vary things enough uh, to magnify adaptive potential, minimize injury risk, uh, decrease the likelihood of monotony strain uh, leading to burnouts, and then uh, achieve the targeted adaptations that you want uh, within the training plan, uh, then you're good to go. So that's a bit of a one-on-one -on, -one on program. Yeah. Um, some really, really, really good points in there. The, the main thing on there is, you know, when you're talking about uh, actual, actually um, knowing what you should be putting in a program and um, the, the example that I can think of um, is actually doing programs uh, with me now, but um, there was a guy that came into the gym and he just did the same thing. Um, he got into a routine where um, I knew when he would come in through the week and he would literally do the same thing all, all the time. And one day I just, I just asked him, have you progressed on anything that you've, that, that you've done? Uh, and it was, he was just doing the same thing over, over and over again, um, rather than thinking about, right, um, of, of, all the points that, of all the points that you've mentioned there. Um, another thing as well is uh, from that uh, actually seeing progress, that there are programs out there, you know, get this in six weeks or do this or do that. And how I explain it to people is I don't just want you um, strong or to be in, be in shape or have muscle for um, that holiday or whatever. I want it all the time for a long, you know, a long period of time, you know, keep, um, keep that consistency, keep that consistency going. Um, when it comes to the actual program side of things, obviously you mentioned there about hitting a muscle two to three times a week. Um, where where's this whole sort of um where people who might not have the have the knowledge base of to know that they need to hit that muscle two three times a week where's this whole thing of oh i need to do chest on monday and leg legs on on tuesday where's that sort of all, all uh, uh come from if you like and where would you point um people to change to change their programming yes yeah, so just let me double check that uh, I got that question right um, because my brain is starting to shut off now. <laughs> um, you were asking when we need to change the training program. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it would be great if the same training program worked for a long period of time. But as I started to allude to earlier, uh, we have a number of built in mechanisms uh, that protect us from. Uh, experiencing exponential growth because think about it this way if the body was designed to build muscle at the when it was exposed to any form of tension simply walking around would make us grow phenomenally big and we would be huge right we would be like giants because we just keep growing and growing and growing from you know the time we we're born but we have a genetic potential and almost like a cap on how much muscle we can build and what this means is that if we do the same thing over and over and over, we essentially get uh, less and less results. So diminishing returns. And this is a result of negative feedback loops uh, within the body. So basically, the more we have a certain input uh, and the more we expose the body to that same input, the less output we get from that. Um, and this uh, mitigates our ability to grow. So the way that we can uh, offset uh, some of this uh, adaptive resistance uh, for another way to describe that process uh, is to vary our training now variation should be additive not detrimental to your results so the last thing that you want to do is jump from one program to another uh, because again at a very pragmatic level that makes things very very hard to uh, measure and manage and to see if you are making any progress and discern whether you're building muscle uh, so you, your variation should be very minor uh, but not so minor that it doesn't 
offset uh, the negative feedback loops, but not so large that it is just complete disruption uh, to your uh, you know, <laughs> homeostatic uh, baseline um, that you just can't recover from it and it's just the body doesn't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. So the way you need to think about it is like almost laying out breadcrumbs in front of the body uh, so that you go and eat one after the other and you know, get towards yeah. gains, right? Um, but if you just keep going in straight lines, you're not really going to get uh, to, to your destination because there's going to be a lot of zigzags along the way. And that can be like variation. Like sometimes we need to change things and, you know, go a little bit off course to, to bring it back. And we can vary training in a lot of different ways. Uh, so we can vary the, all the variables, essentially. So yeah. your rep ranges and loading zones, are the volumes that you use, the intensities that you train with, are the frequencies that you use, the exercises you select. Uh, the order that you place those exercises within a session or within a week, uh, your rest periods, the tempos, there are a myriad of ways that you can manipulate a training program to induce uh, a novel stimulus because that's what we essentially need uh, if we want to minimize uh, plateau over time because we will see less and less return on our investment uh, if we do the same thing repeatedly. Now, where I generally recommend people start varying their training uh, is with their volume uh, and their frequency. So what they can do is once they start to plateau, provided they're recovering, uh, increase their volume slightly and potentially increase their frequency to distribute that higher volume uh, that they're achieving in their program across more sessions. Now, as they start to increase their volume, we generally can't use the same type of exercises uh, because not all exercises are created equally as we know, and some induce more stimulus and more fatigue than others. So for example, if we're increasing our training volume for the quads uh, and we start our program with uh, the majority of our volume uh, on the squats, if we just keep adding volume to the squat, we will beat the shit out of our bodies due to the high amount of axial loading. However, as we add volume and potentially add frequency, we could start to shift more of that volume towards a leg press. Uh, and then over time, if we're adding in more volume and more frequency again, more of that volume that goes towards a leg extension and less and less uh, to the squat over time. And we could simply repeat that process again. Now, I generally recommend varying exercises less frequently than what most people do because if we change exercises too frequently, uh, the body essentially has to learn uh, that movement pattern and especially on uh, free weight, multi-joint, complex uh, motor patterns, it can take a couple of weeks uh, for intermediates and beginners to learn a new movement pattern, uh, which means that they're not making any morphological adaptations. They're in fact making neurological, mostly neurological adaptations, not that they're not making any morphological adaptations, but basically they'll be acquiring the skill more than they will be stimulating muscle growth, right? So uh, what we want to do is uh, manipulate those primary variables, volume, frequency, intensity first, uh, then exercise selection, uh, and then exercise order. So for example, we could have uh, in phase one where we have most of our volume uh, for our quads on the squat. Uh, in that second phase, uh, we could have more volume that goes towards the leg press. Uh, and then you know, we could sub out the high bar back squat, for example, in that phase to a front squat. And then in that third phase uh, where we have more volume than the previous phase and we have more uh, volume going towards our leg press and our leg extension, we would even include a safety bar squat. So we're getting less and less uh, overall systemic fatigue from the squat variation, uh, but we're modifying our exercise selection based on uh, the volumes that we're using. Uh, and then, for example, if you were to repeat this process all over again, uh, you could simply uh, change the way that you went about things and start with uh, a front squat or a safety bar squat at the start. Then include uh, a safety bar, a front squat, sorry, and then move towards a high bar squat in the later part of the phase. Uh, so rotating exercises, um, and hopefully every time you reintroduce an exercise, you are stronger on that movement in the moderate to, re moderate to high rep ranges uh, across multiple sets. And that's going to be a really good proxy for muscle growth. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting point. And especially when you said, uh, mentioned about, you know, the squat and then going on to the, the other exercises, thinking about what, what buckets are, are full. So, you know, if squats absolutely hammer you, yeah. um, you know, that one's already full. Look at the, look at the other exercises, uh, other exercises yeah, totally. that, that, that you're working on. Um, Quite a lot of points there uh, covered for, um, mu uh, you know, muscle building and, you know, getting the most out of your uh, training and your programming. Um, I know that's um, a few points I've taken away from that, which I found uh, really, really interesting. Um, 
for everyone uh, listening, after all the topics that we've covered today, what would be your uh, take-home points or, or words of wisdom for everything that we've chatted today for people listening? Recognize that no plan is perfect and that the best plans are those which are accounting for the day-to-day, week-to-week changes uh, in your stress levels and your ability to tolerate, recover from, and adapt to stress. And most importantly, there is no need to overhaul your program if things aren't working. Uh, This is where thinking like a scientist can be very, very beneficial. And I'm not a scientist, but I've learned from scientists who I think are very, very smart. And I've tried to transfer the ideas and the concepts that they use in science uh, and apply them to my own reasoning, thinking, and cognitive uh, processes as they relate to program design. And that is to think incrementally and not categorically. So don't think that something is better than something else because it's not. Uh, Instead, pay attention to what you're doing now assess whether or not it's working and achieving the desired outcomes at the desired rates that you desire. Uh, I said desire like five times Um, (laughs) and refine the approach, refine things, make small uh, minor adjustments to one variable at a time uh, to determine whether or not uh, you can change that variable uh, to see the progress that you want. Yeah. Uh, Really, really good point to, to finish off. Um, yeah, thanks again for taking the taking the time to chat with me. Uh, I hope everyone enjoy everyone listening enjoyed that um, as as much as I did. Um, for everyone listening who might want to follow the content that you put out there um, or get involved in any of the uh, the education side of things that you put out or you know the seminars that you do, where can people find you and the and the and the get involved with the work that you do? Yeah, so if people. Uh, want to hear more of my annoying Australian accent? Uh, <laughs> head over to JPS Health and Fitness on YouTube. Uh, I do a podcast also. Um, I've had some good guests on there who are very intelligent, so you won't be listening to me talk, but you'll be listening to some really smart people talk, um, which I uh, highly recommend. Um, on Instagram, JPS Education uh, is our education page, uh, as the name suggests. Uh, JPS Health and Fitness, that is our coaching page if you're looking for coaching and then uh, if you want to just learn not a lot but be entertained by my horrible banter and the happenings of my life you can follow me over at uh, jacob skepis s-e-h-e-p-i-s on instagram and yeah you'll probably unfollow me pretty quickly but that's okay i uh, <laughs> hope that i yeah, gave you some form of value in a short period of time that you were one of my fans <laughs> Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely awesome. Um, hundred percent. Everyone listening, uh, check out the work that Jacob does. Uh, really, 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 really interesting. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to, to chat with me. Um, thanks a lot for everyone listening and I will see you all next week.